Adam Zane Cook is an MFA fiction candidate at San Francisco State, and he has a BA in creative writing from UC Riverside. He is a Southern California native and loathes chummy baristas. <laughs> Let's welcome Adam. Um, thank you. <laughs> Hi, my name's Adam. Um, so this piece I'm reading today is from a novella I wrote called An Explanation for You. And it's like vaguely non-fiction-y, and so it's um, uh, it's this, uh, this uh, guy, me, and he's talking to this uh, former friend, you, and it's kind of this explanation for like why he's like had to cut him out of his life. And so up to this point, we've had kind of um, the you in the story gets a new boyfriend and starts becoming that awful type of person who like, when they get a new lo lover, and uh, <laughs> so then, so this is what comes after that. It is the last week of January. Graham has been in Europe for a month to celebrate his graduation. I am stuck in a cycle of missing him, not missing him, feeling bad for not missing him, and then missing him all over again. I've read a book on meditation and I'm trying to view my emotions as being akin to the weather, that they blow in and they blow out, but I can't control them. I imagine this thought is easier to identify with in New England, where the writer lives, where the weather fluctuates ceaselessly. But in the in Inland Empire, with its constant cloudless sunny skies, the metaphor is harder to grasp. I have not seen you since my Christmas party, though your Tumblr and Facebook feed make it clear that you and Chris are luxuriating in capital L of love. I have not been very social with anyone, for that matter. It has become comforting to me to go to work, come home, watch Netflix, read, and go to sleep. I wonder if I am becoming a hermit, or if I am just maturing, and if the two are mutually exclusive. It is a Tuesday night, and I am trying to decide between rewatching 30 Rock, or finally seeing that French-Canadian film everyone has been talking about. I munch on some after-dinner popcorn, take a swig of cheap Tempranillo, I get a text from you. I miss you, darling, you text. Let's hang out sometime. I immediately text back, yes, let's go dancing Saturday. I'll make dinner. Sure thing, can I invite Mandy? Totally. <laughs> I experienced none of the fury I had when you asked to bring Mandy to my Christmas party. Perhaps I am growing. Perhaps, as my meditation book suggests, I am starting to take life as it comes, not as I want it to be. I allow myself to feel good. I feel less good the following day when I get another text from you. I just invited Dennis, is that okay? I do a body scan, I unclench my jaw, I take a few deep breaths, I am at peace, or as close to peace as I can hope for. I text back, totally. <laughs> it is Thursday and I'm making the marinade for the char siu bao I will be serving on Saturday. I get another text, somehow I know already it is from you. Kevin and Trina heard we were all hanging out and asked if they could come too. I finish the marinade, dunk the pork tenderloin in the sauce, and clean up before texting back, totally. <laughs> Friday night, I am rolling out the dough for the bow. My phone goes off, and expecting another of your additions to our no longer intimate dinner, I don't look at it until all the bow are pleated like little anuses and stored in the fridge. <laughs> I clean up, wash my hands, and check my phone. It's a text from Graham. Just found out Wi-Fi doesn't suck in Prague, miss you. It has been a half hour since he messaged me. I check the clock. It must be three in the morning in Prague. Graham is out of the bars. I feel bad for missing him, for missing out on a chance to talk with my boyfriend. I blame you. I reposition my thoughts. How luxurious it is to find for Graham. To want to see him as opposed to it being clockwork. Familiarity breeds contempt. I think of my married neighbors and their constant fighting. Better to long for one's boyfriend in Europe than live with one's odious husband. <laughs> I open a bottle of Grenache Serum Vedda that was on sale at Trader Joe's this week. I put in a Sex in the City disc. What would have happened if we had dated you and I? When we met, we clicked so instantly. It was at Paula's before she'd broken up with Dennis. This is Dennis's friend, she'd said. He's gay, too. I'd made a bacon-wrapped meatloaf for everyone, the one with the hard-boiled eggs in the center. Everyone loved it. You loved it. You still tell people about it to this day. Talking with you felt like I had met one of the voices in my brain. There wasn't a level we didn't connect on. You were funny and compassionate. You had desire for knowledge. You could follow my cultural references. And you seemed so authentic and open in a way that I have never been. And you spoke your mind unselfconsciously, not in the manner of sports bar assholes, but as someone who has firm beliefs, and I admired that. We should hang out more often, you texted me after a few more group parties. 
In the Inland Empire, where gay men tend to be exotic accessories, the idea of having a friend with whom there wouldn't be that cultural baggage was enticing. And so you and I got coffee, and then Ethiopian food at that crummy place in Loma Linda. I went to the drag show at the Menagerie and traversed the 10 out to West Hollywood a few times for dancing. We started seeing each other almost weekly. We got along so well. I, I wondered if I would end up leaving Graham for you. He and I had only been dating for a few months at the time. But you had a boyfriend too then. A different boyfriend, another Chris, in Minnesota. So we became friends. Do you need the distance? Do those miles and miles make your love warm and not infernal? Us together would have been a mess. I see that now. Our personalities are so big, our cognitive devices so informed by suburban sentimentality, by religious bathos, by neat television plot lines. Our dating and inevitable breakup would have led to a schism of our mutual friends, if not a murder-suicide. So it's good we didn't date. <laughs> I turn off my TV and down the last of the bottle. I go to sleep very warm, very happy, and for a stolen moment at peace. There's only a slight headache when I wake up and I count myself lucky. I text you. What time were you coming over tonight? Dancing starts at 11-ish. Figured we could be there around 10, perhaps dinner at 7, pre-gaming to follow. I drink a full glass of water, pull up NPR on my phone, and then hop into the shower. It is from a lacuna in Wait, Wait, Don't Tell Me that I know my phone has received a text. I reach out of the shower, dry it off my hand, and check my messages, just to be sure it isn't Graham again. Dancing, you text. Not tonight, dear. Everyone wanted a night in. I stand, holding my phone for several beats, processing the text. Water drips on my bathroom floor. I get back in the shower and repress the urge to scream. I have taken to screaming when I am stressed, usually just in my car, but sometimes into my pillow or at the back of my closet. But I don't scream, refusing to validate this left turn you've orchestrated. I wait till I'm out of the shower and fully dried off before responding. I write several, several drafts of the text. What? But no, this is passive aggressive, and it leaves you too much room to wriggle to construct the situation. I try again. No worries, no worries. What time are y'all coming over? I delete this without giving it a second glance. I should feel what I feel, or at least that's what all the online anxiety support forums say. I type fuck you, but no, that's not me either. <laughs> I, I close my eyes and ponder what the New England writer of my meditation book would text if his friend tried to pull a fast one and cancel a night out dancing. What are you talking about, I text. When was this decided? I send it off, I'm comfortable with its straightforwardness, but happy with it all the same. You respond almost immediately. Sorry for keeping you out of the loop. Dennis's grandma's wake is today. Kevin and Trina are doing dark January. Amanda can't make it. And to be honest, I just want to night in. The urge to scream becomes too strong, and I bury my head in my pillow. When I recover, I text, of course, I totally get it. See you tonight, exclamation, smiley face. There is only so long one can sustain candor. I get dressed, I internet for an hour, trying not to think about how angry I am with you. I go to my medicine cabinet and grab a Xanax. There are a few left. I got off of Effexor soon after Christmas, but I haven't given up on psychopharmaceuticals. One of the sixth grade teachers at work gave me the dregs of her bottle. She said she had a million of them at home. When it, whether it is because the medicine is particularly fast acting, or that my emotions have been acknowledged and can now pass through, or simply the cleansing melodrama of taking a pill during crisis, I feel better. I go through my day, I vacuum, I dust, out comes the bamboo seam for the bow, into the freeze of the gin bottle goes. At Trader Joe's, I buy party things, crackers, a bottle of rosé, some brie, but not the good brie, in case you eat it all. <laughs> Back home, I make a quick party playlist, pull the bow out of the fridge, I masturbate. Time passes slowly while waiting for guests. I pour myself a glass of Montepulciano and sip and try to read Year of the Flood, though I just end up staring at the same sentence for 30 minutes. Tonight will be dreadful, I think, over and over again. I finish the glass, I resist pouring another, I take a second Xanax. They're low dosage, apparently. <laughs> 6.30 rolls around, and though I know you will be late, I put the oven on warm and bring the water to just below a simmer. I pull out the hoisin, the sriracha, the quick pickled cucumbers, the finely chopped scallions. Astoundingly, at only five minutes past, you arrive with your retina. I direct you all to the brie and crackers while I open the rosé. Just a little, you say, I'm driving. Are these crackers gluten-free, Trina asks. This is the first time I've met Trina. I do not like her. <laughs> <laughs> no, I say. The breeze has been on its own, though. I don't do dairy, she says, clearly proud of being difficult to feed. <laughs> you ask, is there a TJ's nearby? On the other side of town, I say. Why don't Trina and I run over there? We could be back in like 30 minutes if we move quick. Don't come back, I want to say. All of you leave. This whole night was a mistake. I'm too angry with you to form a friendship. 
I have a heartache, a headache, an illness, an imperiled sibling, something. See you soon, I say. Kevin goes with you and Trina, and I'm left with Dennis. He was a mutual friend, so this is fortunate. I asked him about his grandma, he asked me about Graham. We finish the rosé, I open a monastrel, start the bow in the bamboo steamer. Dennis tells me about his recent breakup with Michelle. I tell him about the absolute ball of stress I've been. We somehow end up talking about you. He's really into this new guy, Dennis says, draining his glass. I top him up. I can tell. What's weird, though? He pauses. What's weird? Have you seen a picture of Chris, he asks. Only the ones I Facebook stalked, I say. They're twins, Dennis says. Chris and him. He pulls out his phone and with tipsy effort scrolls to a picture he took of you two laughing, and he's right. We're the mere image of each other, the lankiness, the angular Nordic noses, heads completely bald and with a flurry of ginger hair. A facial hair. The alarm on my phone goes off. The bow are done. You have been gone for 45 minutes. I pop a few of hot bow onto a plate and take them out to Dennis. By the time you get back, we have killed the plate and the bottle, and enter carrying a bag of Burger King. Sorry, we got lost, you say, sheepish. Then we got hungry. It's by the fact that I am not raging internally that I know I am drunk. Just happy you're back, I say, heading into the kitchen to wrap up the leftover bow. Anyone want cocktails, I call. Only Dennis answers affirmatively. They're Negronis, I say, giving Dennis a martini glass. One part gin, one part vermouth, one part campari, want to try? You are too intrigued to say no. You take a sip of mine. Your eyes light up. I can make you a small one if you want, I say. Nah, I say. It's no big deal, I say. I'm good, you say. You change your mind, I say. I find that I like you much better when I'm drunk. I don't mind, even mind it when you bring up Chris. You talk about how well you click, how you seem like soulmates, how natural it's all been. I'm happy for you, I say. I am unsure if this is the second or third time I have said this in the conversation. Dennis has passed out. Trina and Kevin are on their phones. He's coming with me to my sister's wedding out in Temecula next week, you say. I'm a little anxious. My ears perk up. Anxiety. Now we're in my wheelhouse. <laughs> How so, I ask. My sister and I don't always get along, you say. I've actually been kind of dreading it. Like you can't get it off your mind. Yeah. Like no matter how you reason with yourself, it's always just there, I say. Like the TV's on in another room, it's just a hair over the volume that you can ignore. I guess. Do you want some Xanax, I ask? <laughs> no, you say. Are you sure? I push. I have become my father, never taking no for an answer, but I see you considering my proposition. If you're offering, you finally say. I run to my medicine cabinet and count that there are five little white pills left in my bottle. I take out two and put them in a plastic bag. Thanks, honey, you say, pocketing them with such carelessness that instantly I regret right giving them to you. What are friends for, I say. Time passes. There is a gin and tonic in my hand that I don't remember making. We are talking about something, Game of Thrones perhaps, and then you are all leaving for hookah. My gin and tonic is gone. Did I finish it? Spill it? Is that why the towel is on the floor? I put on my jacket. Are you coming with us, you ask, if you don't mind? I have driven you around so many times, I figure I should cash in on some of the accrued mileage. We pack into your car and drive to Grand Terrace or Colton. I am not sure. I have lost track of the freeway sign. We arrive at an ugly, suckered strip mall and walk up to the hookah bar. Such places in movies are always Baroque seraglios, right with effects and decadence. It is therefore disappointing to find upon entering that the walls are unadorned slate, the carpeting that color of Reagan-era government issue orange and filthy at that. The hookahs outside are surrounded not by divans and cushions, but by folding chairs. And worst of all, the clientele seems to be that bearded, not aware enough to be hipster community college dropout that litters the England Empire. You pay the usage fee, and we head out back. We find a group of folding chairs around an empty hookah, and soon enough, someone comes up and lights it for you. There is a friend of yours here, another friend. The only, this one I know, but I can't remember his name. He talks endlessly about his ex-girlfriend, how manipulative she was, how he gave her the Disneyland passes he bought for their anniversary <laughs> so she could take her new boyfriend, how he still loved her in spite of it, how he bought her a star, a literal star. He gave her the stars, and she still wouldn't have sex with him. <laughs> you can't expect things from people, I say. Love is something you, you give someone else. If you... Oscar Wilde has this great quote in De Profundis. It goes something like, like, do you know Oscar Wilde? If you know him in even the slightest, you should read De Profundis. It's very... Profound. I laugh. <laughs> Only too late do I realize that your friend wasn't talking to me. I double down. I'm reading this great book right now. It's about, well, it's, 
It's about anxiety and the fight or flight response. It just fucks with you, you know? I mean, we've been fighting off tigers and stuff for way, 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 way longer than we've been living in houses, you know? When I look around, I see that everyone, including you, is checking his or her phone. It really helped me, I say. You look up, a patronizing smile on your lips. I can't even begin to imagine what that's like, you say. Thank you.